Okay, so after the fiasco in Texas, uh, uh, this man who called himself Guillermo uh, Lisio uh, decides that he is going to go to Mexico. Uh, that San Antonio now has become too hot for him. Um, he had raised his profile in an attempt to become influential in African American politics in Texas, and it had failed. It at the same time it had raised his profile. Whites were beginning to realize that he was African American, so he decides that he needs to change the game again, and he goes into Mexico, uh, and he moves to Mexico City, um, and. Once he's in Mexico, remember, besides kind of playing the color line, he's very entrepreneurial. He he comes up with a very, very interesting idea, this new experiment. Uh, he wants to relocate hundreds of African Americans that lived in Alabama into a colony in northern Mexico. Um, he told colonists, you know, he advertised uh, among folks in Alabama to, to persuade them to come to Mexico. He said that Mexico is better known as the country of God and liberty, and it offers unequaled inducements for agricultural laborers and the growth of cotton and corn. So what he's doing is he's trying to make money off this. If he can get a, a hundreds of African Americans to come to Mexico, he's going to get paid. They're, they're not going to be slaves, but he'll get paid by Mexican agricultural interests because they, they needed workers. And they felt like African Americans might be a good source of labor uh, for their farms and, and fields. Again, it's not slave labor; it, it would be free labor. And um, so it's a business proposition. But he couched it, as you'll see when you read the book, as philanthropy. That this was the greatest opportunity ever offered to the colored people of the United States. Um, so, so he he embarks on this scheme, and interestingly, um, when he's in Mexico, Ellis allows himself to become an American. Um, once he's in Mexico, because Mexico has a very, very different, um, you didn't have Jim Crow laws in Mexico, you didn't have the kind of racism in Mexico that you had in the United States, it turns out Mexico certainly was not a racial paradise. But it wasn't nearly as horrible for uh, people of African descent uh, as was the U.S. South. So in Mexico, ironically, uh, Henry Ellis could finally discover himself as an American. Um, when he was in Mexico, he never passed as a Mexican. Uh, he took pains to uh, emphasize his U.S. citizenship, with, which had a lot of advantages, which it still does, although I think they might be declining, but it's still very advantageous to be a U.S. citizen, even in 2018. And so the fact that when he was in Mexico, he, he, he felt free to allow himself or to embrace his Americanness, uh, it gave him access. It gave him access to connected, well-connected businessmen, um, and it gave him a certain kind of cachet in Mexico at a time when Mexicans were trying to court uh, American um, investors. So very ironic. Henry Ellis, who passes himself off as a Mexican north of the Rio Grande, um, south of the Rio Grande in Mexico, embraces his Americanness. And again, what Jacoby is playing with uh, in this book is this idea not only of color lines, which um, Ellis played brilliantly, but also the idea of, uh, of, of lines, political lines, boundaries uh, between cultures and, and, and that kind of thing uh, between nations. So Ellis just, he, he, there was something about him where he could really see how he could manipulate various kinds of, of boundaries, both political uh, and racial. Now, as you'll see, in, in, the project, the bringing the African Americans uh, to Mexico, was a disaster. Um, the working conditions were terrible. Um, Rumors spread about Ellis that he was, you know, he, he was exploiting his workers, which he really was. And um, the 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 project just was a complete fiasco, and um, uh, it, it just collapsed. And uh, ultimately, 
uh, the African Americans who came in from Alabama uh, into Mexico, they all trickled back into the United States. It, it just didn't work. Um, and this proved to be a disaster for Ellis, not only financially, because he was hoping to make money off of this. And, you know, I think there was part of him who thought that there was more hope for African Americans in Mexico than in the United States. But it was also in maybe primarily a money-making venture. But he, it also sunk his reputation in Texas. And the way we know that is, is, is Carl has looked at the census in the city directory of San Antonio. And in April 1898, after the failure of this scheme, the share, this scheme to bring sharecroppers from Alabama into uh, Mexico, in April 1988, no, I'm sorry, in April uh, 1898, 1898, the San Antonio City Directory, which is a great place to look at um, historical data from this period, uh, next to Ellis's name, it had a C next to it for the first time in his life. And what that C stood for was colored. So the failure in, in Mexico, what it did was, uh, on, the, on the Texas side of the Rio Grande, he, it, it kind of outed him in a way. And in the city directory, uh, the, it was such a high-profile prof disaster that in San Antonio, for the first time really in his life, he was officially designated as uh, African-American. And of course... Uh, the the word that was used at the time was colored. Um, so Ellis, uh, he his his adventures don't stop there. Uh, far from it. Um, he ultimately decides that he's going to uh, come up with a new scheme, and he moves to Mexico City. Um, he moves to Mexico City. Uh, at some points, he declares himself a Cuban. At some point, he declares himself uh, a Mexican. And what he tries to do is create kind of an import-export business uh, from Wall Street in New York City um, and uh, into Mexico. Uh, he married a white woman uh, who called uh, him Jerry, which was her short for uh, uh, Guillermo, her short, the way she shortened Guillermo. Um, and we don't know what she knew about him, but he, his kids grew up in an all white neighborhood in Mount Vernon. Uh, he identified himself as white in New York. Uh, his business interests were pretty successful. He invested in, in, uh, mines and in, in water companies. And, um, at times he made money and at times he lost money. And in one of the most, uh, uh, dramatic instances of his life. He represented the United States uh, in Ethiopia. He became the diplomatic representative of Washington to Ethiopia. Um, Jacoby talks about it, the first scene in Jacoby's book. It happens in 1909. Uh, uh, Ellis has gone back to Mexico and he's taking the train back into Texas. And the authorities, as he's crossing, you, you, you the, there was there was a border agents crossing, and um, one of the border agents decided that they were going to categorize him as African American, and they made him a relocate from the train that he was in, where whites were traveling, into the so-called Negro coach. Um, he refused, but uh, they called in the sheriff, and um, he. Uh, was was moved to the section where African Americans had to ride. Uh, he said he was going to sue the railroad, but it doesn't look like he ever did. So Ellis is a fascinating guy. He used his savvy of the U.S.-Mexico border to carve a space for himself in a, in a society that was very claustrophobic racially. But the sad thing about his life is, is that it consigned him to a life in limbo. Uh, he grew estranged from his family in San Antonio, uh, which he visited secretly, and then he stopped visiting at all. He stepped away from the black community. At the same time, he was never completely welcomed into the white world of privilege and security. Uh, even in New York, which was a very diverse city as it is today, uh, 
uh, he was lonely. He didn't have many uh, uh, connections. And um, so it was, he, he lived a very interesting, but ultimately, I think, a very, very difficult life trying to navigate the exclusionary color lines, the race lines uh, of the time. 